change gears again, and uh, your Kempfert uh, from our group in Bad Norm is is presenting a comparison of two different valve systems for transapical TAVI, a propensity score adjusted analysis. Jörg, please. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege to share with you our analysis comparing two different uh, TAVI prostheses. Just waiting for the slides. There we are. So what we did is a head-to-head -head comparison of the uh, Edwards Sapien XT to the uh, newly approved uh, Symmetis Accurate valve. How can I advance this? Simply clicking the mouse, should be. No, it's not. No. Okay, so. We are all aware of today that uh, TAVI is basically an accepted treatment option for the high-risk um, uh, patients. Uh, we also have discussed a little bit on the potential advantages of the transapical approach in general, which is uh, uh, that it's also no-touch aortic, it's short distance to a target. We have seen Ensign showing nicely how it can be used in the future mitral intervention. And actually, this access allows for a larger sheath, which, is, uh, which makes it quite versatile. So we have seen very early in the TAVI uh, uh, development, new concept uh, facilitated by that larger sheets. So as only one prosthesis was available for years, which was the Sapien for Transapical, in Europe uh, three different options became available just recently, which is the Sumerius Accurate, Engager, and the Jenna Valve, and I would like to focus now on the uh, Accurate. So we all know that there's a solid body of evidence regarding the Edward Sapien prosthesis. We have now some real-world data from the Sumerius Accurate uh, based on the uh, recently um, con uh, recently uh, finished SAVI registry. However, there's no comparison, no data on head-to-head -head comparison, which is the aim of our study here. So to compare our clinical experience uh, with the two devices, of course, we need to adjust for potential confounders, and we did it by means of propensity score matching. Overall, 310 patients um, were included. They either were uh, treated with a sapien prosthesis in 60% or the accurate uh, valve with 40%. So a few words on our decision making. So there are a few things that would favor one or the other prosthesis, which is short coronary distances, we would go for the accurate, and a borderline large analyst would most likely end up with a sapien prosthesis. And all the others, we tried to go for a quite fair distribution to gain experience with both uh, devices equally. I uh, don't have to go into detail with how to implant the Sapien. It's a, a standard technique th these days. Uh, we did a stepwise implant like most uh, groups do. And then since one and a half years, we have uh, stopped doing BAV. So 52% uh, of all Sapien valves have been implanted with so-called direct valve stenting technique. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the accurate, uh, just a brief introduction. So it's a self-expandable stent. It houses a full root porcine valve. Uh, there are these so-called stabilization arches in the upper crown which allows you to uh, go for quite unique uh, two-step implantation technique, and it is available in three different sizes. So the upper limit you can go in regard to annular dimension is 27. Uh, just a brief case to show you the implantation technique. So this is a rather small root here. You can see the uh, partial unsheathening on the left side. Uh, at this stage, the upper crown is uh, still above the native leaflets, and then you gradually can pull in the device into the aortic annulus, thereby compressing the tissue at the annular level and also um, dragging the calcifications away from the coronary arteries. So regarding our propensity score matching, we of course included the typical clinical variables, altogether 29, but also we tried to make sure that we have anatomical factors uh, considered as well, which means the CT-derived calcium score, the axon score, as well as the CT-derived um, analog diameter. After that matching, we ended up with 103 matched pairs, uh, meaning 206 um, patients forming the study group. Efficiency was 80%, so quite good. And the reason for that is that uh, we actually did uh, uh, we did a quite fair uh, distribution of these uh, two valves. You see the uh, huge overlap of these patients. So basically, they were very similar in regard to their baseline profile. So this uh, facilitated a good propensity score matching. You can see that before the matching, especially uh, uh, ejection fraction and also the, um, uh, the effective systolic annulus uh, was absolutely not balanced. So this would have been a huge confounder. And then after the matching, which is then uh, represented by the uh, green uh, dots here, 
uh, there were uh, roughly, there were overall almost no differences left. So it, uh, this tells you that the propensity score matching worked pretty well. Let's have a look on some key baseline variables. You can see here the age, AD3, SDS score 8. Uh, the analyst, as mentioned, now is completely balanced. It's 24 roughly, and also the Eggerson score uh, indicating the severity of the aortic valve uh, calcification uh, it shows no statistical significant difference. So we can basically um, conclude from that that we now have two comparable groups. Let's look at the outcome. Uh, so out of these 206 uh, patients, we have defined uh, some primary endpoints, which is the angiographic paravalvular leak. Uh, that is, was defined anything that was more than one plus. It was close to 8% in uh, both group, no difference there. And then if you look at the echo discharge, you can see that uh, either echo failed to de detect or these power valve leaks uh, truly improved. It's a uh, matter of another discussion, I think, uh, and this came down to roughly 3%. There was absolutely no difference between the groups. Short uh, um, uh, comment on the pacemaker. So it looks like there is a higher pacemaker rate in a self-expandable group, 10.7 versus 3.9. However, it failed to reach statistical significance. And the other way around uh, seems to be slightly higher numbers here for neurological events uh, in the sapient group versus the self-expandable. However, also this uh, difference failed to reach uh, significant uh, levels. However, there was a slightly higher gradient um, visible with the full porcine root uh, uh, prosthesis as expected. However, I think it's from a clinical point of view not relevant. And as expected, redilatation, so post-ballooning, was uh, significantly higher with 40% in the self-expandable group. Looking at the secondary endpoints, ejection fraction uh, and floor times as a surrogate parameter for the complexity of the implantation itself showed absolutely no difference, as uh, nor did uh, contrast requirement. 2% of patients required a rescue valve and valve, and there were two case, one case in each group um, where annular rupture occurred after post-ballooning required con conversion. If you now have a look on the Kaplan-Meier curves, you can see that the one-year survival is uh, pretty similar, around 80%, and there's absolutely no difference as the log rank is 0.4. So we can conclude that despite uh, the uh, typical limitation of this single center non-randomized trial, we try to do our very best to minimize uh, all the potential bias. And uh, based on this uh, matching, we can uh, say that both devices have demonstrated um, excellent function outcome without any meaningful uh, differences. In a self-expandable group, as expected, um, there was the necessity higher to go for post dilatation and the one-year results are quite favorable if you compare that to the outcome that we see in the typical European registry data with both devices. So I think the future task will be to learn how to tailor the device selection to the individual anatomy of uh, each patient. Thank you for your attention. Great, uh, great presentation. This is open now for, uh, for discussion. So, Jorg, I have a question for you. You know, I, I know that there's not statistically significant, but when you do look at a stroke rate of 3.9 versus, you know, 10.7, to me, clinically, that's significant. Uh, just like your gradients aren't very different. Uh, they, they're statistically different, but not really clinically different, right? So, uh, on the stroke rates, are those the patients that had BAVs or no BAVs? Did you see? I know you, the next presentation is going to talk about no BAV plus BAV, but for this presentation, does that make a difference in your mind? For um, does that make account for the differences in stroke rate in this page, in this study? So actually, uh, the stroke rate was lower uh, in the self-expandable group, right? Right. So this was something that was actually unexpected because with the accurate prosthesis, you always need to pre-balloon. You had a 40% of post-ballooning. Mm -hmm. Also, you could argue that that uh, um, implantation itself mm -hmm. and also the stabilization arches and all these things might contribute to a higher stroke rate. But actually, we've seen. Uh, the exact opposite. So I think it's just a num it's, it's just, just by chance. It's just the numbers, and it's statistically not significant, so I don't think that there's a uh, true reason behind it. And as far as your pacemaker rate, again, it seems like to me that somewhere uh, the self-expanding air is going to hover somewhere between 10 to 15, 10 to 25 percent. Is that, is that, do we just need to say that we're okay with that because there's not that much of a PV leak rate difference, right? Yes. So it was, uh, was a 2.5, 3.5 percent, so not that much of a PV leak. Do we just need to accept the idea that we're going to have a higher pacemaker rate with nitinol-based technology, and that's just where it's going to end up, somewhere between 10 to 15 percent? 
Uh, we are all aware of the, the Sapiens 3 results that also showed higher pacemaker rates, around 13%. We have to say that our experience is even higher. So I think that, yes, we most likely need to uh, uh, pay the bill for having no PVL. Most likely, most of these devices will have a pacemaker rate of around 15%, and this is going to be considered good results. But also we should not forget that if you look at these octogenarians conventional AVR, pacemaker rate is not 2%, it's typically also 7%, especially in calcified root. So and taking into account, in addition, that uh, there's recently some uh, publication showing that a pacemaker implant, although, although we all don't want to have it for ourselves, it seems to be even protective for one-year outcomes. So maybe we need to change our attitude towards pacemakers. That's right. I think that's, that's something that we need to consider. And the, and the last question I want to ask, maybe Tommy has a comment also, is that so looking at this data, somebody comes into you right now, when you go back next Monday and you have a uh, surgery, how do you make a decision on what you're going to use? See, I've still struggled looking at the data. There are some pluses and minuses for both groups. How do you make that decision? You just flip a coin and say, Monday we're going to do some medicine, Tuesdays we're going to do the sapien valve? So actually, I, I think it's going to depend on your uh, center volume. Mm. So if you have a high volume center, most likely you can allow yourself to play around with three, four different devices if you have a smaller a volume, uh, then most likely you need to focus on either one or two devices, otherwise you will never surpass the learning curve. So we have more or less focused on two devices for the transapical. Uh, of course, this is going to be the task for the future, learn which patient fits, uh, uh, which procedure fits best in which uh, situation. I think the only uh, uh, groups that, is, uh, that we have identified yet is uh, sm small coronary uh, distances, we would go for Symmetis, we can discuss LVOT calcification. Lots of uh, people saying that you then need to go for self-expandable device. However, you've seen it. There was also one annual rupture in the self-expandable group because once you are forced to do post-dilatation, then it's the same story. Yeah, especially with 40% redilation yes. rate. Tommy, did you have a comment? But basically, just regarding that question, I think it's good to have a self-expanding and a balloon expanding yep. valve in your armamentarium. That's, I believe, uh, Pretty, pretty good actually because then you have both treatment options, especially in very heavily calcified valves. Jörg, what I wanted to ask, like uh, the, the mean gradients, which I believe is clinically not relevant. Yep. The uh, Cimetis valve will uh, move on to a pericardial valve. Will that uh, decrease the gradients? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, you can look at it uh, from two different sides. I mean, it's a full porcine root. The advantage is the leaflets are not shaved or, or thinned out by any means in order to get it down to 18 or whatever French. So you couldn't, could uh, think of it as it's most likely going to be uh, not an issue for long-term durability. On the other hand, we all know it that the full porcine root valve will have higher gradient compared to uh, thin porcine or pericardium uh, bovine uh, leaflets. So yes, they will come up with a new version that is supra annular, similar to a core valve or portico, and then we will most likely will see um, lower gradients. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for a great presentation.